This would ordinarily be the place to say the President of the United States doubled down or tripled down today on his remarks of the weekend, tweeting that four non-white congresswomen should go back to their home countries, never mind that three of the four are native-born Americans. It would also be the place to play you their reaction to discuss how many Republicans condemned or failed to condemn the remarks, followed by questions about where this all fits into the president's strategy for appealing to the base. And yeah, we will get to all of that tonight, including what the four congresswomen had to say. But as interesting as any or all of those items might be, they're also the things we talk about so we don't have to bring up something else. Namely, that what drives the president to say what he says is not just about politics, as some have suggested. It's not just about winning votes or winning arguments or repeating whatever he just saw on Fox News. It's not three-dimensional chess. It's really something much simpler. So simple and frankly so ugly that it is tempting to just take it as a given and then move on, to file it away as merely Trump being Trump, when that is really the whole point, Trump being Trump. What comes out of his mouth is a reflection of who he is and who he's been for as long as he's been a public figure. This, for example, is who he is. We're building a wall. He's a Mexican. We're building a wall between here and Mexico. That was the president two years ago, saying that an American-born judge, an American, has dual loyalties and cannot be fair because of his Mexican heritage. Then House Speaker Paul Ryan called that, quote, the textbook definition of a racist comment. Another word that fits the president maybe far better than his oddly long ties and expensive yet ill-fitting suits is demagogue. President Trump has shown yet again he is a demagogue. In case you're unfamiliar with the word, I'm quoting Webster's Dictionary, a demagogue is a leader who makes use of popular prejudices and false claims and promises in order to gain power. So with that in mind, here's what the president tweeted yesterday. So interesting to see progressive Democrat congresswomen who originally came from countries whose governments are a complete and total catastrophe, the worst, most corrupt and inept anywhere in the world, if they even have a functioning government at all, now loudly and viciously telling the people of the United States, the greatest and most powerful nation on earth, how our government is to be run. Why don't they go back and help fix the totally broken and crime infested places from which they came? Now, in point of fact, the countries, in quotes, that Congresswomen uh, Ayanna Presley and Rashida Tlaib and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are from, that country is the United States of America. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, as a naturalized American citizen, is from Somalia and has lived here since she was a teenager. But a demagogue doesn't care about facts. The president labels them foreigners. The fact that they're all women and women of color only adds to his eagerness to label them as something other than American. Now, if you believe the president's own words, these four congresswomen look like the other. Now, sometimes that other is the terrifying unknown other, as he described when he first launched his campaign. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. So the message there, people looking for asylum, people looking to come to this country, they're not like you or me. They're other. He added that he also assumed there were some good people, but the focus was clearly on the threat, on the other, which the president often describes as being in our midst, or which he describes using words like invasion or infestation, the latter of which was often used to describe Jews in pre-war Germany as the so-called enemy within, hiding in plain sight. And even at the time the president was saying those things, it, it wasn't especially new. And that's because the president, you'll recall, though it now seems like decades ago, the president also smeared the first African-American president as the other. I would like to have him show his birth certificate. And can I be honest with you? I hope he can. Because if he can't, if he can't, and if he wasn't born in this country, which is a real possibility, I'm not saying it happened, I'm saying it's a real possibility, much greater than I thought two or three weeks ago, then he has pulled one of the great cons in the history of politics. I mean, in other words, it's very possible, he's saying there, that the 44th president of the United States was a con man, which in addition to being textbook, textbook projection for Donald Trump to be calling somebody else a con man, gets us to the textbook definition of racism. 
and I'm quoting again from Webster's, a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and, ca uh, and capacities and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Norway, after all, isn't sending us rapists, according to the president. Mexico is. And Kenya may have sent a little baby con artist. And African Americans, according to a former Trump senior executive, can't be trusted around money in the president's eyes. Barbara Rez, who has been on this program many times, telling The Atlantic, Trump talked about how he didn't want black people handling his money. He wanted the guys with the yarmulkes. He was very much the kind of person who would take people of a religion like Jews or a race like blacks or a nationality like Italians and ascribe to them certain qualities. Blacks were lazy and Jews were good with money and Italians were good with their hands and Germans were clean. Now again, the textbook definition of racism is a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and, and capacities. And again, this belief seems to extend both forward and back throughout the president's public life. His first appearance in the national stage was when the federal government sued the Trump family company for large-scale housing discrimination against people of color. He famously doubted and still doubts the innocence of the Central Park Five, all non-white despite DNA evidence and a confession from someone else. By the same token, and no pun intended, he could not bring himself to single out and condemn neo-Nazis and white supremacists in Charlottesville. And even on more benign matters, the president seems to attach group characteristics to individuals, such as a stereotype, a mistaken one that all African Americans are from the inner city, or, laughable as it sounds, that they all somehow know one another. Here he is taking a question from April Ryan, who is African American. Mm -hmm. Are you going to include the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Well, Hispanic I would. Caucus, I tell you what. Do you want to well set up the, the meeting? Do you want to set up the meeting? No, no, no. I, Are they I, friends I, I, of I'm yours? I'm just a reporter. No, get I, a, set up the I meeting. I know some of them, but I'm sure Let's they're Let's go set up right a meeting. Now. now, again, none of this is new. He's been saying things like this literally for decades. They define who he is. It brings to mind another page from Webster's, the one on the word bigot. A person who is obstinately or intolerantly devoted to his or her opinion, own opinions and prejudices. So yes, to use the Washington phrase, the president today doubled down on his racist attack on the four congresswomen because in a non-Washington phrase, that is just who he is. If you're not happy here, then you can leave. As far as I'm concerned, if you hate our country, if you're not happy here, you can leave. And that's what I say all the time. That's what I said in a tweet, which I guess some people think is controversial. A lot of people love it, by the way. A lot of people love it. But if you're not happy in the U.S., if you're complaining all the time, very simply, you can leave. You can leave right now. Come back if you want. Don't come back. It's okay, too. But if you're not happy, you can leave. 